Hi everyone and uh, welcome back to my YouTube channel. So um, what I'm starting to do now is actually um, I'll, um, I'll start introducing the Atom Probe and most importantly how to work with it and how to operate it and everything. And this is why um, I'm actually now broadcasting not from my desk, but I'm broadcasting from, uh, from my Atom Probe lab. And um, here um, I've set up the cameras and everything so I can show you a little bit how the Atom Probe works and um, most importantly how to operate it. So these videos are actually meant for people that are working with Atom Probes. So um, if you work in my lab or if you come to use the Atom Probe in my lab, you can watch these videos as a reference and as a matter of fact I would expect you to watch these videos and, and, and know uh, the do's and don'ts of Atom Probe usage. Um, before you come in the lab. I think this will save every everyone a whole lot of time um, and open up the Atom Probe to a lot more users. One of the reasons um, this, I think, can work is because unlike a lot of other instruments that we have, the Atom Probe is actually fairly easy to operate um, and also very safe to operate in um, that there is not that many things that you can break if you operate it the right way. Okay, I probably shouldn't have said that because um, some people actually see that as a challenge rather than, um, rather than something good. Um, but anyway, um, this should, these videos should help you to actually operate the Atom Probe safely. Um, these videos are, however, not a replacement for proper training. So. Um, you will not allo be allowed to use the Atom Probe just based on, uh, on watching these videos. You will have to go through proper training and you will have to get um, proper clearance from us. Sorry, I'll turn the gain down a little. You'll have to get um, proper... Um, you have to get permission from us to actually use the Atom Probe. And uh, one of the reasons for that is, of course, that um, the way that the Atom Probe will be operated might change over time. And the, the reason for that is there might be software updates, there might be changes to the hardware, or sometimes it's just there is some defects where you need workarounds, um, some valve doesn't operate correctly and you need to know how to, how to circumnavigate the issues and so on and so forth. And there might also be uh, changes in, in policy regarding how, to, um, regarding how to store your samples and so on and so forth. Um, but apart from that, these, uh, these videos should give you a, a very good impression of, of, um, of how you can get started. Um, of course, if you're not in Erlangen, you can still, uh, still hope you'll find these videos useful. So the Atom Probe that I've got behind me, um, is a, um, I'll switch to the other view. So the Atom Probe that I've got behind me is a uh, Kamika Leap 4000 XHR. And if you've started doing Atom Probe, you'll probably by now know what that means. That means it's a micro electrode Atom Probe um, with equipped with a UV laser, with a small spot UV laser, um, in order to be able to measure non-conductive materials and semiconductors and so on and so forth. Um, this kind of model is, by the way, I, I think must be right now um, the most common atom probe out there. Um, from those series, the 4000 series, there's also another model called SI. Uh, the difference between the two is actually beyond that video, uh, but in terms of operation, there's no difference. So if you've got a LEAP 4000, it doesn't matter if it's got a laser or not, um, or if it's, got the, uh, if it's got the HR or the SI detection system, you will be able um, to operate it much in the same way. Uh, and if there are differences, I'll point out the differences between the different, the different models. Um, in operation, the main difference will be if you've got a laser or not. If you don't have a laser, um, then of course the laser measurements will not be, uh, uh, will not be useful for you. Or the, the, the tutorial for the laser measurements will not be useful for you. Um, apart from that, it should actually cover, um, cover a lot of users out there. Um, and so maybe surprise your, leap, uh, your, um, your supervisor and already know something in advance about how to operate the leap. Um, 
to give you an overview of the machine, well, I've got the machine here, and I'll point uh, I'll point out things on the machine. But let's let's have a look in some of the uh, uh, some of the fundamentals of, of machine operation, and the fundamentals are mostly going to be governed by um, by the vacuum system. So, uh, atom probe tomography uh, demands you to operate in ultra high vacuum because we're passing off single atoms, so we can't have surface contamination. We want to minimize surface contamination. We can't get rid of it entirely, at least not in, at current instruments. Um, and, um, and for that purpose, we, we need to work, we need to work uh, with our samples in a way that we do not contaminate the ultra-high vacuum. That's one of the most important things to, uh, to always remember, to not contaminate the ultra-high vacuum. Um, and in the, so in, in the first video, I'll show you what the atom probe, like what the different parts are and what, what, you have to, um, what you have to remember about the different parts. In the second video, I'll show you how to prep a sample for putting it in. And, I'll, and uh, that always means uh, working very, very clean. So working in ultra high vacuum also means that, um, that the, the system is hermetically sealed to the outside. So there is no feed-throughs. There's no feed-throughs in the sense that there is uh, any, any motion fed-through. The only way that you can feed through motion is actually through magnetic coupling. And this is um, what this thing here does. So this is a magnetically coupled linear movement rod. There's another one in here that you can't see. So that's actually mounted below and it's, it's, it's driven by a motor. But it's essentially the same thing just with a motor on it. Um, and here we've got an outside magnet and an inside magnet, and uh, this uh, and the, the coupling goes through the uh, uh, through the pipe here, through the tube here. Um, and this makes sure that the, the system is hermetically sealed. So this governs the, the overall design of the atom probe, pretty much. That we have to have this ultra high vacuum, okay? Um, but in order to to show you the fundamental layout, I'll just switch over to a different uh, to a presentation that I've um, prepared. Um, which is a contains a diagram of a local electrode atom probe. So this is a bit of an older model. So this is the the original one, if you will. So this is the um, this is the leap. I don't think it was even called 3000 at the time. I don't I don't care. Anyway, I chose the old image uh, simply for the reason that um, it's a little bit more open. It doesn't have as many covers on it, so you can see a bit more what's going on. Uh, in the fundamental layout, what we have is we've got three chambers. So we've got a load lock chamber, so you can see the arrow here. We've got a load lock chamber here. Um, the load lock chamber is exclusively to pump down your samples. And when they're at a vacuum that's high enough to be stored in the atom probe, um, then, um, then you can move them from the load lock chamber into a buffer chamber. The buffer chamber does exactly uh, what the name suggests. It's a buffer for your samples. So if you've, got, um, if you've got samples that, that are finished already but have not yet been measured in the atom probe, um, have not had an experiment in tunnel, then you can uh, uh, store them in the buffer chamber. And um, from the buffer chamber, it goes into an analysis chamber. An analysis chamber naturally has the highest vacuum. We've got a vacuum about a bit higher than 10 to the minus 11 millibar or 10 to the minus 11 tor. I think it displays it in millibar. Um, anyway, sort of around that, that order of magnitude. Whereas here we're about an order of magnitude high, and here we're another one or two orders of magnitude higher in pressure. Okay? Uh, and this is always important to remember. So we go from low vacuum to high vacuum through the, through the system. Um, the main uh, reason for the buffer chamber is that unlike if you've got a high vacuum but not ultra high vacuum system, like for example a transmission electron microscope, um, a normal, of course there's UHV transmission electron microscopes as well, but just a normal uh, transmission electron microscope, then um, it takes a little while for all the contaminants, and that's mostly water vapor that's stuck to your sample. As soon as you take something out into atmosphere, you get a monolayer of water vapor onto it. And that the water vapor actually needs to come off, and it comes off very slowly, and I'll show you in a, in a minute why. Uh, and it comes off very slowly, so we need to pump down for quite a while. So I would say three hours is the absolute minimum, but if you don't want to contaminate your system, 
pumping down overnight is actually highly, highly recommended. Uh, which already brings us to the first policy in my lab, which is uh, overnight pump downs. So we schedule our measurement days for the leap in advance, of course. So, you know, a week, in, a week ahead, or if you need to book it earlier than that, uh, you book your measurement day on your leap, on the leap. Um, and so you know exactly when you're going to need your samples. But the sample fabrication, be it uh, by electropolishing or by a focused ion beam system, should then not be on the same day. That's absolutely a no-no, um, unless you've got a very special reason to do that. There's a few like very short-term clustering where sample just changes in a very short amount of time. Then you might get an exception, but you actually explicitly have to talk to us and ask for the exception, okay? Anyway, so you need to, uh, you need to prepare your sample at the latest the day before. And what you then do is you take the sample, and you put it into the load lock chamber. And how to do that, I'll show you uh, in the following video. Well, not the load lock chamber, uh, but how to put it on the carousel. Um, in there, the sample goes onto a carousel. So it doesn't just put a single sample in there, but you can put up to six at a time in there at the same time. Uh, which, also, uh, which also is important to get, uh, to get a flow of samples in and out, because of course, while you're putting new samples in, you might want to take old samples out. Um, so once the load lock chamber is pumped down overnight, um, and it is at a, at a vacuum that's usually in the range of five times 10 to the minus seven or better, we would like it to be in the 10 to the minus eight range, ideally, okay? So if you pump down overnight, you probably get a pressure of um, uh, less than uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 7, which means you're in the 10 to the minus 8 range. You can move your sample into the buffer chamber. Uh, once it's in the buffer chamber, that pressure, it doesn't need to, to stay in the buffer chamber. Uh, you can actually then pretty much move it, uh, move it into the analysis chamber straight away. Um, for that, of course, the pressure in the buffer chamber, if you put your sample in, uh, sorry, if you put your sample in and the prefer, uh, uh, pressure in the buffer chamber, goes up into a non-acceptable range, then of course you can't move your sample straight in, okay? Um, the pressure in the buffer chamber actually must be in the, in the range of 10 to the, uh, in the 10 to the minus nine range, okay? If it's in the 10 to the minus nine range, it should be in the low 10 to the minus nine range, say two to four times 10 to the minus nine range, but if it's in the 10 to the minus nine range, then it's okay. Um, Sometimes you get spikes in pressure just simply because there's little pockets of gas being trapped between metal parts that, you know, that touch each other. They so just wiggle things a couple of times and you, will, you might get some gas uh, coming out of um, some nooks and crannies of your sample or your entire setup. Uh, but once you're at that pressure, you can actually move into the main chamber. Anyway, we're going to get to discuss it a little bit later. Um, on a modern atom probe with a uh, with laser, of course, you'll have an entire laser unit here. Oops, and you won't have uh, you won't have those viewport glasses um, because, of course, it's a laser. So you know, you know, you're not supposed to to look into a unit that has a laser in it, and so on and so forth. Um, so anyway, so this is the basic layout. So you've got the load lock chamber, the buffer chamber, and the analysis chamber. On the analysis chamber, you've also got the cryo. Uh, which produces the annoying sound that you can hear in the background. Uh, and in this system, there's also something you might not have on your system anymore, like we don't here, um, which is gases for field iron microscopy operation. Um, but lucky enough, we've actually built a field iron, a separate field iron microscope, so we can we can still do field iron micro microscopy, but we we can't do it in the in the lab. Okay, ultra high vacuum. So. Ultra high vacuum is the reason why we need to work really, really clean when we operate the atom probe, okay? Um, so the, the vacuum levels that we are working at are sort of in the uh, 10 to the minus nine, 10 to the minus 10 um, pascals. So this is in pascals, sorry, there's a 10 to, uh, there's two orders of magnitude between uh, difference between pascals and millibars and, 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 and tors. Um, but so you can see, we're, we're really at the, uh, um, at the lower end of, um, um, of pressures. And in that, in that, in that vacuum area, um, the mean free path um, 
is about a kilometer or up to 10 to the 4 kilometers. So there's no collisions between your atom that comes off your tip and any gas atom. Um, but um, that's, not the, that's not the important bit. The important bit is that we don't get absorption on the, on the surface because even though it's called atom prop tomography, it's actually a surface uh, method, okay? Um, and um, we also work at cryogenic temperatures. The reason for that is that we want to impede surface diffusion. So if we pass off an atom, we want to we wanna be sure. It doesn't always, you know, it's not always true. Um, but we want to make sure that that atom actually comes off right at the spot on the tip uh, where it was sitting in the material. So we do, what we don't want to happen is that the atom was sitting there in the material and then it moves around, moves around, moves around and it passes it off somewhere completely different because that of course would make atom probe tomography pretty pointless unless you just want to get the overall composition. But you, know, you can do that in other ways. Um, and at these cryogenic temperatures, which is typically in the 20 to 80, sort of in that range here, from 20 to 100 Kelvin. It's a cryostat, so technically you can set it anywhere up to room temperature, um, but really usually we operate somewhere between 20 Kelvin and, uh, and 80 Kelvin. Um, the cry itself usually has about, yeah, about 10 Kelvin-ish, um, but there is some, some heat uptake between sample and, and, and um, between the sample and, uh, and the cryo, so that the sample doesn't exactly have that temperature. So we're usually, say, 20 Kelvin and up. And as you can see, some of the, uh, um, some of the hydrocarbons and um, some of the longer chain hydrocarbons then uh, will already have vapor pressures um, that mean that they can stick to a sample and slowly outgas. So um, this means that, that hydrocarbons are a bit of our enemy. Um, and just to demonstrate what can happen there is that um, here we've got a diagram of time it takes for a monolayer to desorb to come off of a surface versus the, the energy with which, which, we, uh, which, with which the, the molecule sticks. Um, and here what's most important is actually the, the point here. Um, so um, if you've got weak bonding, of course, stuff comes off pretty quickly. If you've got strong bonding, stuff will never come off. So those two regions here don't interest us very much. What really interests us is the peak here. So if you've got uh, at room temperature, of course, we had cryogenic temperatures, but at room temperature, um, if you've got molecules sticking with about 100 kilojoules per mole, um, at, uh, at 10 to the minus 8 pascals, it will take about a year for them to come off. So atom probe, we're about here. So you can have, yeah, if you've got, if you've got molecules sticking somewhere between 80 and 120 kilojoule per mole, um, they will come off over, over weeks, months, years, um, and you will just permanently get outgassing in the atom probe and you will get contamination of your vacuum. So we need to make sure that all of these compounds don't actually, um, don't actually go into our, uh, into our atom probe system, okay? So we need to work as clean as possible, which means we need to remove any contaminants beforehand. Good. Um, just to show you what the whole thing looks like um, in close up, so the atom probe. So I'll, I'll show you how the whole thing, um, how the, the layout of the atom probe looks like in this, in this sketch. But of course, I've got the atom probe right behind me already. Uh, showed you a little bit. Um, so again, this is a LEAP 4000 XHR model, which means we've got a laser unit, which is off camera, you can't see that right now, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter anyway, because you're not going to be concerned with doing anything with the laser unit. Um, but so we've got the, uh, um, we've got a load lock here, and I'm going to vent the load lock in a second, so you can see what it looks like when we vent the load lock. And uh, then we've got the buffer chamber here, we've got some viewports, so you can always see what's happening inside. Uh, and we've got gate valves, CF100 gate valves in between. Um, and, um, and these CF100 gate valves make sure that the vacuum is good between the different levels. Uh, the pumping layout of the system is that we have uh, turbo pumps in the, uh, uh, in the load lock in the buffer chamber. And we've got an iron pump for the main chamber. Um, the turbo pumps are pumps that have um, 
that have rotors in them, just like turbines really, um, that spin at very, very high speed, about 1500, uh, 1500 hertz, at least these small ones. If you get larger ones, they spin a little bit slower, uh, but the small ones spin about, at about uh, at 1500 hertz. Exactly 1500 hertz, if they're not spinning at 1500 hertz, then you've got a vacuum problem. Um, they won't spin above 1500 hertz, but they might spin below 1500 hertz. That means you've got a leak, okay? Um, and that would not be good at all. Anyway, so you've got, the, uh, uh, you've got a load lock here uh, with a quick access door, which we use to put the samples in. Uh, you might already notice the quick access door will have the knob down here. Uh, the reason for that is that with the quick access door, we don't use the knob to screw down a quick access door. Um, the knob actually for those quick access doors is only there so they can mount it sideways. Um, it doesn't actually really serve a function here on the leap, okay? So uh, just let it dangle off, uh, dangle off on the side and when you pump down, just close the lid and the vacuum will pull it shut. Because if you over tighten it, it will actually pull down on one side and sort of pushes it up on the other side. Uh, and that also worsens your vacuum, okay? So just let it dangle off on the side. Um, then we've got the, the turbo pump here, so that gives us the, uh, the vacuum. Um, these turbo pumps have a base pressure, so they can reach a base pressure uh, in the 10 to the minus 10 range, roughly, um, but it won't reach it if you've got a quick access door here. So this is really the vacuum leak in the, in the load lock chamber, and the reason why it doesn't go to the, uh, to the lowest ultimate pressure that the pump would actually provide. Um, in here we've got the specimen carousel, and you'll see the specimen carousel in a minute. Um, and uh, below that, as I said, the, the vacuum gate valve. Um, the gate, valve are actually, uh, gate valves are actually valves that, that move in and have sort of a, um, I'll show you later, uh, they've got sort of a, a, a little plate in there uh, with the seal that's pressed against, this, uh, against the recess, and this provides a sealing action. Uh, what that means is that if you want to have proper sealing, you need to keep the gate valve clean. So you need to make sure that you get as little dust as possible into the load lock chamber. And when we actually put our sample in, I'll show you what that actually what it actually means. Um, one important thing. Um, okay, I'll talk about that when we actually do the uh, when we actually put the samples in. Anyway, and then we've got the sample carousel. Um, then here again, we've got the we've got the buffer chamber also pumped by a turbo pump and, um, and uh, we've got a transfer rod that we then will use to insert the samples. When we move the whole thing up, we've got the controls here uh, to move the specimen carousel up and down um, and we can use it also to rotate the specimen carousel. Uh, the, vacuum, uh, the vacuum is actually measured by, um, by a combination of Pirani and Penning gauges um, plus also some Pirani gauges in the pre-vacuums, but anyway, um, the only thing you need to know about these gauges is that they, had, they, that they have two areas. They've got a low vacuum measurement range and a high vacuum measurement range, and you will just see weird, uh, weird numbers appear in the controls when they switch over. So don't be too much worried about those. Um, yeah. Um, but also sometimes what can happen is that uh, one of the two parts of the, uh, of the measurement gauge is broken. Um, then you will, might get a, a decent reading either in the low vacuum range and not get a reading in the high vacuum range or, vice, or, or the other way around. And you just know that one of the two, uh, one of the parts of the gauges is, is actually broken. Uh, if you do your own instrument maintenance, of course, this is all standard parts. You can get them as a replacement. Um, they're all from, from FIFA, so you should be able to just yeah, put a new one in and it should work again. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's the basic layout. Um, and now I'll just vent the load lock to show you what that looks like. Um, the reason being that as the next step, I'll show you how to put samples into the carousel. And um, that will be the next video. Uh, of course, you can't see right now what I'm doing um, in the operational screen of the Atom probe. But we already have a screen capture device on order, so we will be able to show you straight off of the Atom probe, um, or straight on the Atom probe, what, um, what that looks like.
Okay, so the only the only thing that I need actually to um, to take the samples out is um, is a little transfer rod, which I will be grabbing in a minute. Uh, you, you know what? Actually, we'll skip that and um, I'll show you how to operate with the transfer rod and how to in um, how to insert samples into the carousel. And next time, when we actually have the screen capture card, and I can show you both the um, um, both the operation of the computer together with the uh, um, with streaming with streaming me. Um, putting a sample in and everything, then I'll also show you how to operate the load lock. <laughs>